Hello brothers and sisters. Welcome to a new series um, that I taught before on the other channel uh, regarding the sons of God and um, angels and um, in various parts of the Bible such as Genesis and Job and the title of this series is going to be called The Nephilim Deception. And some may wonder why I will use a non-King James Bible word. Um, but I want to do so in a way that exposes the falsehood of this fable. Um, as uh, one of my brothers in Christ across the pond says that it is a fable that has grown many legs. And um, it seems to grow in the telling with each person that tells it. There is no real consensus on it outside of the truth of God's Word. Um, all sorts of crazy things float around uh, regarding this word Nephilim. There are, are people who have taken the idea and turned it into alien races, um, inbreeding with people and creating a superhuman race as they would say. There are um, very strange tales out there, such as um, I was reading one about this former housekeeper for the Queen of England said that um, she personally witnessed the royal family turning into lizard people. Um, if I was a Brit, I would be pretty offended by such a thing. Uh, but it's one of those things that... Uh, this stuff belongs in the tabloids. You know, when I was growing up, there was no YouTube. But you had those um, magazines there at the checkout of all the grocery stores and the supermarkets. And they'd have pictures of these aliens that come down to Earth. And um, supposedly uh, people were meeting these aliens and then having their babies. And... With each passing time, the tale just gets bigger and bigger. So, I use the word Nephilim not in the sense that I believe in it, but because it is a deception. And many people who are looking into it uh, won't even be looking for the phrase sons of God or that kind of thing. They'll be looking for Nephilim because there are really quite few uh, King James Bible believers who trust the book and the truth of it. It is our sole source of truth. And so many people will intermingle other books with it, not even realizing that they have diluted the truth of God's Word down to something that's meaningless. Um, for example, they will uh, put the book of Enoch right up by the, the King James Bible and say, well, I know it's not God's Word, but boy, I tell you, it sure got a lot of interesting stuff in there, and wow, it really helps explain Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Well, brothers and sisters, my take on it is this. Um, God explains Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 just fine if we're willing to study we have to be willing to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I will tell you up front that I do not believe that Job chapter 1 verse 6 or Job chapter 2 verse 1 or even Job 38 verse 7, those references to the sons of God uh, refer to angels. They refer to people every time. Now, there was a time when I was taught that Job 38, 7 referred to angels where it says uh, the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy and I believe that for a brief time and I just believed what I was taught and the reason is it's because I was lazy. Um, once I really opened up the book and studied it and compared scripture with scripture I came to realize how very awesomely deep the Word of God is. 
And I'm not here to change your mind. There's going to be some people that um, are going to continue believing that angels came down out of heaven, they mated with women during the uh, time before the flood, that God put them in chains into everlasting darkness and they're saving them for judgment. And they're taking all these little bits and pieces of scripture to make this doctrine that has no real bearing on the truth. And I realize that I'm not going to change some people's minds. In fact, it's not my job to change your mind. It is my job to sit here and teach the truth of God's word because someday I will be held accountable for what I have taught. And I will give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ as to whether or not I taught the truth. To be a teacher of God's word is a very uh, heavy burden. It is um, a thing that you take very seriously, and I do that. And I'm not going to mince words just to appease men, uh, for we ought to obey God rather than men. And I do not seek to be a man pleaser in this matter. Nor am I going to uh, break fellowship with people just because they believe that doctrine. Um, as I stated in an earlier video, one of the very first videos on this channel, in marking, avoiding, and breaking fellowship, it is not an issue for which I'm going to break fellowship with people. And I would hope that they would not do the same with me either. Um, what I would break fellowship with people over is uh, the gospel, plain and simple. If people teach a works-based salvation and they mock the cross, then I'm not going to call them my brother. If they teach repent of your sins heresy and they're not just confused about it, but they're in earnest about it and teaching it all over the internet and YouTube and uh, puffing themselves up with arrogance and pride and thinking of themselves more than they really are, then no, I can't fellowship with those people. But I understand that uh, some people are not going to receive um, what I have to say, no matter how much scripture I teach, no matter how much I go and show um, that those things that are taught falsely, wrongly, really fall outside of the jurisdiction of Holy Scripture. And while I will quote outside sources, we're going to, in this series, we're actually going to take a look at what other people say. We're going to take a look at those uh, pseudo-bibliographical uh, novels, as I would call them, and, and quote them. Um, it is done in the sense that I believe that those things are in error. Um, the standard by which everything is done, believed, taught, received, is this book. It is the sole source of all truth in the whole universe. Um, it is a book that we can hold in our hand, believe it, receive it, trust it. Uh, outside of that, nothing else can be trusted. So that is my stance on it. If you're not one who believes that the King James Bible is without error, you might have some trouble getting through this series. But I fully intend to uh, teach the Word of God in truth and in sincerity. And um, I'm not going to allow um, anyone to negatively impact what I'm trying to present here. And I, once again, am not here to try to change your mind. I'm not here to um, win you over, so to speak. I'm just here to present the Word of God and the Scripture. And I ask you to do one thing. Ponder it. Look in the Scripture to see if these things are so. Be a good Berean. That's what I ask you to do. So, today, um, I just want to cover a few basic things. Um, right off the top of my head, I don't have any notes. But, um, I just want to put some thoughts out there about the Word of God and about this whole thing about the Nephilim. First of all, Nephilim is not a King James Bible word. Nephilim is um, actually in the NIV and it may be in some others. 
but they thought that they would take the Hebrew word and pretty much leave it untranslated. Now, there's a problem with that. And my Bible says that there were giants in the earth in those days, whereas the NIV and some others will say Nephilim. Uh, one version even says divine beings uh, when it comes to who the sons of God are. But the word Nephilim is left untranslated, which means you're going to need a scholar to help you see what it says. But not so with the King James Bible. When you look at the King James Bible and you look at Genesis chapter 6 verse 2 and verse 4 and you see about the sons of God and you see giants, um, you start thinking, okay, well what about, uh, where else does the Bible talk about giants? Then you see Og of Bashan who had a bed that was about 13 feet long and he was from the remnant of the giants. Um, you see Goliath, who was nine and a half feet tall. And you see that um, it's a genetic thing. Whenever uh, you have one giant that had six fingers on each hand and six uh, toes on each foot, and he was the son of a giant. So you see that these things are passed on. Um, you could look at modern day giants and uh, to kind of get an idea that giants are just really big, tall people. Uh, they exist today. Take for example, if I was to walk into the locker room of an NBA team, and let's say it was a special locker room where all the biggest basketball players that ever played the game was in there together. You'd have Wilt Chamberlain, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, you'd have all these players that's that's well over seven foot tall. In fact, the average height of the top ten tallest players of all time in the NBA is about seven and a half feet tall. So, me, not even being five feet ten inches tall, would walk in among these NBA players and they would be like giants to me. They would be very large. I mean, Shaquille O'Neal is well over seven feet tall and he weighs well over 300 pounds and uh, compared to me he's a really big guy but he had normal looking parents his mother was uh, not a large woman or tall but sometimes you have genetic uh, situations where you have a tall dad and he has a tall son so people tend to get outside of reality with these things and the danger of that is once you start believing the fable that angels bred with women and create a giant offspring um, Nephilim as as the NIV calls it then you start heading off into unchartered dangerous territory because after a while uh, you start having itching ears and you heap under yourselves teachers that will teach you those things that uh, tickle your ear and, and they say what you want to hear because before you know it you're sucked into a world where uh, you're looking at all these fake pictures on the internet of giants that are 20 feet tall and then you start doing the research and oh the book of Enoch talks about these giants and why the book of Enoch must be legitimate because Jude mentions him and First one thing after another. You see the devil will take a little bit of, of truth and put a whole big lie around it. He mixes it. Um, take for instance, if you had a loaf of bread. Beautiful, nice smelling loaf of bread just came out of the oven. But it had just a smidgen of dung in it. Just a little bit of poop. Would you want to eat that bread? I wouldn't. Even though Ezekiel was told by the Lord to eat um, cow's dung, uh, I think that would be very difficult. But, and, and fortunately, God let him substitute man's dung for cow's dung. But, um, I think once you put dung inside of bread, you've ruined the bread. 
the bread is no longer any good. So, the only way to have the truth is to have pure, unadulterated, unfiltered truth. Some people, they can't handle that. They, they can't deal with just the truth of God's Word. And that's where I'd like to stay in this series. I, I realize I'm not going to answer every single question in the first two videos. So some people are going to say, well, he doesn't really have the answers. Now, I don't claim to have every answer. There are some things that I've studied um, that just keep me pondering. But I'm going to share with you what I have learned in this series. And uh, I encourage you to read the King James Bible, to open it up for yourselves when I give you scripture, and to think about it. And always, the way you study the Word of God is to compare Scripture with Scripture. And remember another uh, very important thing. The New Testament reveals the Old Testament. Things that are hidden in the Old Testament make perfect sense in the light of the New Testament. And we have to be very careful when we look at a passage of Scripture that seems confusing. And be sure that we've covered all of our bases thoroughly when researching it within Scripture. Um, I don't totally discount all commentaries, but you need to compare the commentary with Scripture. Is that where they're going with it? Is that right? Um, I've looked at J. Vernon McGee commentaries. I've listened to J. Vernon McGee on the radio for many years when I was a kid. And then Later on, I come across that he uh, believes the gap theory. He didn't have a whole lot to say about it, but um, nonetheless, you can't go 100% with commentaries. You can't go 100% with what anybody says because uh, the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. So you always go back to the book. It's always the book. The, the King James Bible is the source of all truth. And... It's, it's a tangible book that we can hold in our hands and read it and believe it. And I do not claim to have all the answers in this series, but there is a whole lot to go over, a lot to ponder. And I don't want people to be deceived. Um, there have been things that I was deceived about. I was under the impression at one time that angels were created outside of time. And indeed, they are not. They, too, were created within time. And I'm going to show all the scripture for those things. And uh, there is just so much to go through. And I do look forward to going through this series and to teach on it. Um, they are not going to all be in order. I'm going to do a video and come back to it and eventually make a playlist with it. But uh, in the meantime, I think that's going to do it for this video because it's only meant to be a short introduction. Uh, so, until next time, God bless you and take care.